ki muri o ha e tu whakaiti i hana waha te kororo, mona te punu te kororo. Fiti mai te rā, fiti mai te rā. These are not my words, these are the words of the ancestors. And the ancestors call forth so that once again the sun may shine on all and every land on the planet and bring back the times of peace and harmony. And the ancestors also wish to be acknowledged for who they are, who they were and who they still are today because they live on within each and every one of us in our genetic dispositions. Ke moa, ke moa te hei Māori ora. Well, I'm um, doing things a little electronically today, but um, switching on a little thing here, and we'll see how we go. The, um, it's quite strange, um, I don't know if other people um, notice this very much, but uh, I was talking to my friend Barry Brailsford the other day. <clears throat> He's exactly one year older than I am, so I take a lot of notice of what he shares. <laughs> and we were discussing the fact that um, <clears throat> what's happening to our memories, you know, at um, And he said, listen, nothing to worry about, because as we move on in years, we accumulate so much stuff, it just takes a bit longer to pull it out. <laughs> So, so occasionally I find myself talking and I'll have a name of someone in a historic sense or a date and it's just there somewhere so 10 minutes later it comes out. So occasionally I refer to things and uh, little notes. First of all before I start on, on my journey I want to read what I call the five elements of Aotearoa plus I'll mention what I call the fifth element. The fire spirit of the east, which is passion. Fire, ahi. Fire is of the wider realms, born of the stars, the far reaches of the universe and of the inner world, the molten core of this planet. Fire is a powerful element, the spirit that carries all before it. Let the flame reveal the truth of your journey. Fire is an agent of powerful change, the spirit that carries all before it. So you are gifted the power that cleanses, that creates and shapes anew, the transforming power of the sacred flame. Then we come to the element of earth, Papatuanuku, Gaia, the mother earth. And limestone is known as the white stone in the Maori world. It is given the name Pakiho, and is of the realm of Hine Tuahonga, the keeper of the bones, for it holds the story of life on earth. It is a stone of power and purpose. We are reminded that we are the sum of all that ever has been, and that we carry forward all that will ever be. We are of the earth. We are of the cosmic dust and spirit of creation itself. Walk without shoes on the earth to take in the sacred energy. Work with soil in your garden. You are tilling the soil without and the soil within. Then we come to water. Why? Water is the spirit of the West. Without water, there would be no life. Today, 97% of all the water on the planet is stored in the oceans. Now the oceans join everything. They touch all continents and embrace each and every island. But interestingly enough, ancient traditions tell us there are only two oceans on the planet. One is called the Noa, N-O-A, which is the planet of all the people, sorry, the waters of all the people on the planet. The other ocean is the Tapu Ocean, which is the ocean of the gods, the mystical ocean. And that is the Pacific Ocean of Aotearoa, New Zealand, sits between the oceans of Noah of the people and the oceans of the gods. So New Zealand is very much 
in the ancient tradition, a gateway. Air, spirit of the north, how order. The air we breathe is the gift of light. When oxygen came into air, it was born of the magical interplay of water, minerals and light. Then came life. And air invites you to make a space for yourself, to breathe deeply and examine where your life is and where you wish to be. It is a time to remember that you are the dream maker, that until you place before the universe the dream you wish to walk, it cannot be. Air cries that it is time to soar, to fly as the birds fly free. Seek out the distant horizons. Open your mind and feet and feel the heartbeat of freedom. And I thought I would just touch on what I call the fifth element, which is Wairua, which is the spirit of this land. And the Wairua, as a Māori people will tell us, is the wind or the breeze of the gods. It's the mystical breeze which we sometimes feel in certain places where we happen to be standing still. So now, let's press a little button here and um, see what happens. If you see a look of panic on my face, you realise I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> oh my gosh, it works. <laughs> Is that all right, Murray? Oh, good. Okay. First of all, I'd just like to encapsulate a little <clears throat> about myself personally. Uh, I was born, well, yeah, well before the middle of last century, in 1938, in a place called Napier in Hawke's Bay. So I am what people today would refer to as a member of Ngāti Rā, which is the tribe of the sun, the tribe of the land, the tribe for everybody. My maunga or mountain is Te Mata Peak. The waters of my river is Tutaikuri. And so I spent my formative years there. And then when I was very young, living in Waikara Moana, Lake Waikara Moana, and living up the east coast. So at those times, one was exposed to, to much in the way of stories uh, shared around cups of tea and mud eyes in the kitchen and things at night time, listening to what the elders and the kuya had to share. And this imprinted on my young mind at the age of 9, 10, 11, and remained with me right through. And, um, okay, a little personal stuff. When I was 16 and a half, I had... Um, I was experimenting as a budding chemist, I suppose, and I blew something out which, which blew me up and parts fell off all over the place. So that was one of those traumatic events which happens in your life. Okay, but life still goes on, even for a 16-year-old, which is wonderful. And then I guess the next wonderful thing that happened in my life, uh, I met my wife and got married. She's here today, and we've been married for 51 years now. So, uh, on we go. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's just wonderful. And then I guess we're looking at the things which happen in your lives, which are, which are landmarks, and they affect you emotionally and, uh, and physically. And um, then, uh, about 1973, I had what is commonly known as a near-death experience. And we're not really understanding. Myself, I was very allergic to the sting of a bee, and one night standing out front of our country store that we had at the back of Huntley, a bee dropped off the rafter, fell on my neck and stung me. I was poleaxed. Three people loaded me into a car and off they went to the nearest doctor, which was a long way away. So whilst they were speeding through the dusk in the car, worried about me expiring in the back seat, I'd gone. The heart had stopped. I'd stopped breathing. And I was on the journey that we've all heard about or read about, and some of us have possibly experienced too. So that is life-changing. You come back, even though you don't wish to come back, you come back and here you are, but you change forever. So <clears throat> these are things which happen in our lives, um, dra dramatic events or um, traumatic events which um, shape and fashion who we are. So more than 25 years ago, I embarked with my wife, Raymond, on a journey to discover more about this land. And this came about by reading a book called The Song of Waitaha, The Stories of a Nation. 
And um, in reading this, we were quite entranced. It filled in a lot of gaps uh, in the history of this land and also created a lot of controversy when it was published. So I met with um, Barry Brailsford, uh, who was the editor and writer of the book. And um, Raymond and I traveled extensively over the North and South Island, seeking to find the places spoken about in Song of Waitaha, to follow the sketch maps there and go and experience these for ourselves. So being amateur archeologists, this was right up our street. So before the uh, Waitaha came here, there were other people living on the land, the Nahue, the Maru Iwi, and even the Heimudu people from China. Waitaha came here 2,000 years ago. The Heimudu people from China came here 4,700 years ago. These are things that we've uncovered over years of research. A lot of these things not yet accepted by academics <clears throat> as being proven, but it's all slowly happening, so it's, it's rather wonderful. Now, it's interesting too, because everywhere I travelled, um, Raymond and I would take photographs of ancient sites and often there was nothing in the land to see where things would be because the Waitaha people and the people before them very, very much working in harmony with nature. They didn't go and sculpt the landscape and they didn't have to defend themselves against enemies and put in big trenches and palisades. So the impressions they left in the land were very, very gentle, very hard to find their footprints, but they're there. And so for a number of years, we traveled to and fro, north and south island, going to these ancient places. And um, some places I found myself being drawn back to again and again. And I'd already done the measurements and taken the photographs and written about these places. What was the attraction? Sometimes the sites are in magnificent cliff-top locations or mountain locations, incredible views and vistas, or amongst the forest or on the riverbanks. But I suddenly realised there was more to these places than just the sheer beauty and the fact the ancients had left their little footprints there. I suddenly found that, first of all, <clears throat> I realised that often when I was on my own at these sites, um, taking some more photographs or even doing measurements, I was being observed all the time. There was someone looking at me, and you do the old trick, you'd be working way there and say, so you whip around quickly. <laughs> There's no one standing on the edge of the forest that you can see. I mean, anything cripes, woo. I don't know who it was, but so, okay, so you carry on. And then, it's interesting, uh, things started to evolve uh, in another way. Um, probably 20 years ago, Raymond and I did a crossing of the Southern Alps, going over the ancient greenstone trails to carry Poanamu, the sacred stone, the stone of peace, from the west coast, right across the mountains um, to Castle Hill, where some of you have been to um, <clears throat> in the Alps. And um, Raymond and I, um, part of our journey was uh, we were hitched a ride on a helicopter and we were flowing. You can do that down the west coast, by the way. You'd be surprised a helicopter flies and you wave your arms. A bloke comes along and says, listen, mate, um, we, we want to go sort of... Oh, I said, well, I'm heading that way, I'll drop you off. So where you go and you head off. <laughs> so anyhow, more or less like that. And um, so we were well ahead of the other 22 people in the party. And our job was to clean the hut up and get the firewood in and bring the water in. So we did all that, and by about noon we had everything done, tickety-boo, and so we sat down on the banks of the Wilberforce River, way up in the headwaters, towering mountains with snow all around the tops, icy blue water crashing over the rocks in front of us. We sat down to contemplate and meditate in this beautiful place. And not long into, our sitting, I started to hear voices singing and I kept my eyes closed and trying to figure out I can hear singing but I know there's no one here but I can't understand the words. So then of course what happens, I open my eyes and turn to Raven sitting beside me and she immediately turns to look at me and we both said the same, did you hear singing? We both heard singing. Now first of all we thought it may have been the other 22 members of the party we were a long way behind because often on these trails we would sing trail songs to help you to 
you know, stride it out and get over the steep parts and down the, the other side. When they eventually arrived, which was uh, about six hours later, because they did a, a double journey that day, they didn't have time to sing. They were just so pushed. Barry was really pushing them. He was leading them. And so uh, that was the first time that I can remember that I actually heard something. I immediately thought, oh, this may be a song of the ancestors, perhaps the ancient guardians of the mountains. And that's where I slotted that. And then, of course, um, we spent a number of years, or well, a number of three years, two months every year for three years, we travelled over the North and South Island with a man called Hamish Miller and his wife, Barr. And they, uh, he was a geomancer and a dowser of some renown, as people here who are dowsers would possibly know of his work. And we brought him to New Zealand to travel with us to all the special places in the landscape, the sacred mountains, the taboo places and to see what it is or what it was that actually made them special. So with his dowsing technique, of course, he was finding all sorts of wonderful things would emerge out of the ground when he walked around with a single dowsing rod. And I'll be taking you on a dowsing journey on Tuesday, by the way, so you experience all this if you haven't before. And way he'd go, we'd walk around behind him with little sticks and anything we could find and coloured string, stringing out the patterns he was finding. And these were like mini crop circles emerging out of these places all over the North and South Island. Some similar, but often very, very different. And as people like Hamish are, are want to do when you ask them the question, OK, Hamish, um, <clears throat> this is another magnificent piece here. Look at the geometry. What does it mean? And he'll look at you and say, listen, my place is to bring these out not to interpret them, that's for other people. So, all of you, I've got a whole portfolio of the most incredible drawings all over New Zealand, which I want someone to interpret. <laughs> but these places where these beautiful forms and shapes came out, um, there was also a vortex created over them, he, he measured that. And he also said to us that <clears throat> the lines which flow beneath the earth um, such as ley lines, if you like to call them that. I used to call them energy lines, and I'll tell you why I changed that shortly. And um, a lot of them would cross over at what we call a hub. Two or three lines would come in and go out three lines would go out the other side. And um, these were, were flowing, and these were two-way flows, um, which he detected. So, and some of them appeared to be linked. We did not trace the ley lines from place to place in New Zealand. It would, take too long and have been a very, very large job. Uh, but we just um, put the, the specific places on maps. And some of them were obviously linked because there was a similarity between designs in certain places. Certain places like Castle Hill, um, where we went one year, measured certain radiating lines, something like 64 radiating lines. You go back the next year, the thing had distorted into a very, very odd sort of shape. And then when a ritual was done there, an ancient Māori karakia was given on that site, the whole thing realigned itself and shaped up to the most beautiful lotus-like flower pattern. So there's something there, there's something interesting in these places. And so we, we travelled with um, Hamish quite extensively and um, scratched our chin about all these places, had great adventures in the meantime. And then one day, um, after his last visit, I was giving a talk in South Auckland to a group. And I was standing in a paddock somewhere, it was a large gathering. And after I'd finished extolling the wonders of travelling with Hamish and Barr, and dowsing, and talking about energy flows under the ground, very well-dressed man, he was actually wearing a collar and a tie out in the middle of the paddock, which was good. Very professional man. <laughs> So he walks up, introduced himself, I forget his name, I didn't know it at the time, because I went into a state of shock. He said, um, I'm so and so and so and so, and I'm a quantum physicist. And of course I had only a couple of years before seen what the bleep do we know, and so I was dying to run into one or two quantum physicists somewhere. And suddenly my, my whole mind was full of various things I wanted to ask him about string theories and quantum mechanics, but that all went. And he said, look, he said, I just love what you're talking about and it's so interesting. He said, but there's one piece of your terminology which is not correct. He said, you're talking 
<coughs> about energy flowing beneath the surface. He said, that's not how we understand energy in quantum physics. No, he said, the two-way flows you've got are flows of information. Now this was a biggie for me. I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, if this is information, what sort of information? And Hamish had actually told us that not only were there subsurface flows, there were deeper flows beneath those in the planet, there were those so many meters above the planet and then those right up in the atmosphere. So he could detect these at so many different levels. So I suddenly thought, my gosh, we're living in a web or the matrix as people like to call it nowadays. And um, then I got to thinking, if this is information, aha, I remember my studies of Eastern mysticism way, way last century sometime, <laughs> that the, um, the Akashic records. And I thought, wow, this is where everything is, was, and is going to be. I thought, how intriguing. And then, of course, I remember back to what the bleep do we know, where Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, nice little goatee beard, and he's standing forth there, expanding, expounding forth, saying, listen, he says, memory, we can't find anywhere in the human body where memory resides. We've looked in every orifice, we've looked at every possible place in the body and we can't find where memory is. Either it's not in your little toe, it's not in your elbow, it's not in your heart, and it's certainly not in your brain. And so I thought, memory. So I thought, okay, if these are information flows and we live in this incredible matrix, and I'd also been studying people's work on the fact that the human body is an antenna. And if it is an antenna, it is perhaps a receiver and a transmitter. Okay, I thought, well, this is good. So then you join these other little bits together again. And I don't know if I came up with two or seven, but <clears throat> I suddenly decided that as I'm talking to you now, I'm recounting all these stories. They're coming out of my mouth, I'm articulating them, but they're not coming from anyone here. I'm pulling them in from there. Just a theory, interesting. And um, so uh, I go along that way. And sometimes when I can't recall things very quickly, um, it just may, may be a bit like our Wi-Fi. Sometimes we have good reception and sometimes we don't have good reception. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the memory thing again. So there we are. <laughs> the, um, now also, um, over, over time, as we um, made these journeys and uh, of great interest, I started to become aware more of subtle energies, if you'd like to call them, that exist within nature within the forests, within the waters, and within the stones of this land, and in fact, in this whole of this landscape. And um, this, I guess, is the first time that, um, or second time that we had contact with what I call the fairy realms, the realms of the Apatapayarehi, or the Tudehu. And these are beings that emerged in my research um, talking to lots of people and suddenly I was getting stories coming in, unsolicited stories, meeting people, meeting Māori people, meeting people in the country as we travelled around and for some reason fairies would often come up and someone would say, well, wait till I tell you what happened to me. I thought, what's going on here? So I started to make notes of these things. I thought this is um, fairly interesting. Now, before I go on here, I'm going to press a button Oh yes, and I'm just going to go into here. Gosh, this works. I've never done this before. This is perfect. And in my research, I came across the fact that um, there was a book written by Geoffrey Hodson entitled Fairies at Work and at Play. Most of you will know about this. Hmm. And um, he's quoting here, and during the celebration of Mass, I became aware that nature spirits of many kinds approached and hovered in a great radiant cloud in the air immediately within reach of the vibrations of the ceremony. The smaller creatures, fairies, tree sprites, and some mannequins bathed in the atmosphere of power in continuous and graceful motion. The higher and more evolved members of our hidden congregation remained relatively motionless, watching and absorbing the force poured out and adding enormously to the purity and beauty of the service. I'm quoting that because um, 
it's a piece I just came across reading uh, a book four days ago. I joined an organisation in England called the Theory Investigation Society, which sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> and um, founded about 70 or 80 years ago by a lady whose name eludes me. It'll come to me probably tomorrow morning during breakfast and I'll tell you all then. <laughs> and um, she was collecting stories from all over Europe and other parts of the world, right down to Australia and New Zealand, uh, inviting people to write in through connections and put down their fairy stories. So she collected about 700 of these with the view of publishing it, but she passed and the publishing was not done. But three years ago, the um, Fairy Investigation Society was reborn and a new board was formed and lots of interested people. So they published a book on her findings. And the board is headed up actually by a professor of medieval archaeology from one of the colleges at uh, Oxford University. And um, he is now conducting a census around the world, which is available on the internet, for people to share their present encounters with the ethereal and fairy beings. And so far, um, on my newsletters which come through, it's up to about 400 reports so far. So there is something going on there which is um, quite intriguing. And by the way, I must insert here, you've probably been aware of a little bit of music tinkling in the background. Hmm. This is just a uh, little teaser for what I'm going to be talking about on Tuesday. That music, which is, is coming from this piece lily here I bought from home. I have a little device, I won't talk about too much at the moment, I'll explain that on Tuesday. But she is singing a song in conjunction with the elemental beings that are involved with her. So that's the little tinkling sound you hear in the background. That's Peace Lily. She travels with me extensively. She travels with me more than my wife does nowadays. So. <laughs> but that's okay. After 51 years, we have an understanding. <laughs> Raywin travels with a stick of broccoli, you know, a head of broccoli, so we've all got our sort of um, <laughs> way we look at nature. <laughs> Anyhow, the, um, so one thing started to lead to another, and um, fairy, or stories of encounters, and I think the first one I heard uh, was of two, uh, two men who came back from uh, World War II in the early 20s, a Māori man and his uh, Pākehā mate, Karaka and Peter, and they, um, we took an affidavit from him about 25 years ago, and the story he told was just quite astounding, that as two young men, after the war, World War II, they came home and they worked for the government in developing rehab farms, which are farms which should be allocated to, allocated to return servicemen. They're working right in from the Hokianga Harbour, a place known as the Weimar Valley. And as he was telling us that um, they were working very, very hard and every 10 to 12 days, a truck would arrive way, way down the end of the road and bring in supplies for these two guys. And they were living under canvas, plenty of spring water, lots of firewood, and then would come the food. But they found after many weeks of um, eating dried foods and things like this, that they required something a little more fresh sus sustenance. So they had a single shot 22 rifle with them, and they got to every Friday when they finished work for the week, they go hunting for kiddoo or the bush pigeon, which was permitted in those days, back in the 1940s. And he said, after a period of weeks, um, we really had a taste for the, the bush pigeon. And uh, suddenly we found that there were no, none left around the camp. So we thought, we went far and wide, nothing. And then the forest rose up this escarpment, very, very steep, up to the top. So I thought, okay, young and fit, we'll climb up there with our rifle and we'll go hunting up towards the top. So away they went, climbed up there, got to the top, and as I was <clears throat> sharing with someone the other day, uh, often when you're tramping and in the forest in New Zealand, you'll come to a clearing for, for no reason. There's grass growing in the middle of nowhere. So it, it breasted the hill out of the bush, straight onto a plateau which was mostly grass with a few clumps of tea tree bush and then the forest on the other side. And so, just uh, getting their breath back and looking around and um, Peter stepped backwards and tripped over a rock and fell into the bushes. Luckily, the rifle wasn't cocked 
and she was carrying the rifle. So he fell backwards with a, an expletive or two. And um, as he did this, Karaka turned around to, to look at what had happened. And he said, suddenly five little figures sprung out from behind the bush and started to run diagonally away from us, not directly away, but diagonally to the nearest point of forest, which was over there. So by this time, Peter was picking himself up. Karaka was pointing. They are both looking like this. And they gave incredible descriptions of what these people looked like, of what these children looked like, as they thought they were children. First of all, what are children doing here? There's no farms. It's just impossible. This all flashed through their minds. They saw what they were wearing. They were able to describe how they were wearing woven flax garments and things like this, and little kites or little kits around their neck. And um, he said, we're still pondering on these children. And very, very quickly, within a matter of seconds, they run across the clearing. And as they reach the forest on the other side, they start to go into it. Then one at the back, slightly taller than the others, long hair, turn around to look at them. And he said, it was a bloke. He had a beard. And he was only this tall. And suddenly, they thought, oh my gosh, this is the Patupahirehi. And amongst Māori them, these beings were very, very real and still are to a lot of people today. So that got me quite excited. And the fact that um, this man had told the story on a number of occasions over the years, uh, apparently um, it had never changed. It was the same basic story. Wonderful story. So that got me interested. And then, of course, the, the classic story which came our way about nine years ago. And this is a group of, um, mixed group, uh, age group of, of Māori men. They were all forestry workers. And they had been working in a forest up around the Waimamaku area, which is north of Waipua Forest in Northland. They'd been felling pine trees there. And they'd been working all week, and there were several of them in the van heading back down the coast through Waipua Forest to Dargaville where they mostly lived for the weekend to be with their families. And so this was on a Friday night and it was just after eight o'clock when they're coming through the forest. And um, some of them were already dozing in the back seat and there were three sitting across the front of the van. Suddenly the driver had to slam on the brakes, virtually screech to a halt on the Tarsil Road. And um, there in the headlights, according to the two witnesses we spoke to separately, was a row of children walking across the road in front of them. From down the bank on the right, across the road, up a bank between a couple of kauri trees growing on the edge and disappearing. Now this was all happening in the full headlights, full on. First of all, once again, what on earth are these kids doing here? This is dangerous, where's their torches? Where's, where's their teachers? And someone said, well, a bit late for kids to be out and there's no tracks around here. And suddenly, the fear, once again, the apprehension came in amongst some of the Māori boys there. And they said, oh my gosh, that's the Patapayarei. Those are the fairy folk of the forest. Oh, we shouldn't be seeing them. And they were quite frightened. They had to sit there while up to 20 little figures made their way slowly across the road and walked up the bank and disappeared into the forest. That got me very excited, to the point that I went back up there with a dear friend from Dargaville, and um, we spent, I think, about seven or eight hours <clears throat> at that very corner in the middle of the night, staked out with infrared cameras and listening, <laughs> listening devices. We thought, we'll capture them on film. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> as you know, OK? <laughs> Oh, so the things we do, the things we find ourselves doing, but it's, um, let's have a look there. So then I started to gather stories together, okay, uh, and lots of them. Uh, then we made a documentary three years ago, went into the forest up north and also down a Puri or a forest um, in the middle of the North Island, once again with a view of capturing something on film, which we didn't not consciously, at night time, staking out in the forest is um, quite interesting. It can get quite boring. There's an, uh, to start with, there's anticipation. This is it. Wow. If there's anything out there, we're going to capture it on film. No. We did capture sounds in four different occasions with the two groups we had out there that night with four cameras. We caught clicking sounds. Click, click. 
click, click, like two sticks spin, and it would go. It would only be click, click, like that, and then gone. And later on, it would come from another direction. So we captured that, not knowing what it was. We've since le learned that it is a means of communication between people from these realms. Interesting. So, um, but we did capture something inadvertently. We were doing a, um, a reenactment of a story of a lady walking through Waipua Forest, and we were in a forest up north. And whilst our actor was doing a reenactment, um, we filmed something over her shoulder in the distance, which we didn't see until we were editing the film because all focus was on her. And so we did capture a strange anomaly. Um, I guess it's not that we set out to capture the fairies in a, in a sense. It would be lovely to do this. There are other ways, I think, of connecting with them. But also, I did have an interest in the fact that there are or were many stories about there being a small race of people living in New Zealand before, um, before Māori arrived. And I was trying to work out whether there was a difference between the stories that Māori had and the superstitions about a, an actual physical race of people or somebody from the fairy realm. So it was a two-way thing we were looking at, yeah, which is interesting. And that's interesting too because uh, I guess that um, I'll digress a little um, from the fairy story here, um, but with our investigations and our amateur archaeological work up north, uh, we can go and do work where no qualified archaeologist dare goes or write about it or talk about it because there's certain procedures they have to follow, which is fair enough. Um, but we were taken to a cave up in the Hokianga Harbour which um, had skeletal remains of more than 60 small people. And we took an anthropologist with us to look at the bones in situ and we have photographs and measurements. We can't do anything with this. It's incredible proof that there were small people living here. Small skulls which are completely mature in every way and bones, we couldn't assemble all the bones because they're so tangled up inside the cave which had fallen down. But um, we could see that these would have been between three foot, six, four foot tall. So we do have proof that there was a small race of physical people living here, but very hard with cultural sensitivity to know what to do. So it sits there as one of these wonderful mysteries that we know of and uh, I like to share with you. Now, when, we, when I look back at the, um, at the history of fairies and fairy beliefs and notes here, once upon a time, a long time ago, before our ancestors painted on cave walls, there was a time when humans and fairies were from the same world. The fairies were content beings who grew out of the earth, out of the winds, out of the trees, the clouds, the waters and the oceans. According to some stories, humans came from the stars and they had special knowledge and skills which they freely exchanged with the fairy of this world. No one knows to this day why humans forgot their origins and became more earthbound, or why the fairies with their magic shifted to a different dimension behind a veil of mist. At first few noticed the loss, but after a time members of both races remembered and have now begun seeking ways to reunite these worlds. And I think that's important. When we sat with um, various Komatawa talking about these stories and personal tales were shared, the consensus was it's a time to re-establish communication with these realms. It is really us humans that cause the rift between the elementals and the fairies and humans because we used to coexist. We share the same biosphere. I wouldn't mind betting we even eat the same foods. And I mean, we could probably be all quite surprised except for those who have the sight of how many fairy folk there may be in the room with us now as we talk. It does happen. Okay. Okay, Mary the Fairy. Hello. I can actually see you. Wow. Quick, get the camera out. So, then we say, um, if you're on a quest to find fairies, there are many paths in which to wander. But there's only one rule I found from reading things. Allow yourself to go back to the place in your childhood 
where everything that you did or knew was true. You believed in truth and your childhood world was filled with wonder. That was at the time where we could have, if we didn't, have had contact with these other little beings. So, just in general terms, what is a fairy? A fairy is an entity that has conscious awareness and exists in a way that is not necessarily in a human form. Fairies are very much dependent on what is in their environment. If a fairy's basic energy is that of a tree spirit, these fairies shepherd the trees. If a fairy's mission is to be a water spirit, they'll be in the lakes and the streams. Now some of them are storytellers, and it is like that they themselves are stories, and they go through the world absorbing and experiencing, and that experience is in their story. We see them in a fleeting movement of light, or hear a distant tinkle that sounds like laughter. My first encounter, in a physical sense, other than hearing, was um, staying in a hut in the Puriora Forest many, many years ago at a retreat. And um, bedding down for the night, there was about 30 of us there, all the bunk rooms were full. My little bunk was right under a window and I was settling down and snug down in my sleeping bag and suddenly this tapping on the window and laughing. And I knew there were some children with one of the groups further, further uh, down in the building. So I thought, I'll catch these little children out, playing a practical joke on me. Slipped out of the sleeping bag, stumbling in the dark, threw the curtains back and threw the window open, because there's no one there. And I thought, oh, okay. So they anticipated this, so I ran off. I thought, okay. So I sort of hung about, sitting on the edge of my bed for a while, dozed off, because next thing I know, there's tap, 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 tap on the window like this, and <laughs> laughter going on. So this time I was ready, threw the curtains back, through the nothing there. So I dived down the passageway into the room where the families were sleeping with three or four kids, all tucked in bed, fast asleep. <laughs> that was my first real experience other than hearing, and which was wonderful. And I'm the sort of person that um, I don't have to have all the experiences. I don't have to see, actually see these beings. But I know people who do, and they'll share with me, and that's enough for me. And so I th find that quite gratifying. So it is possible, too, to coax fairy into your nature photographs. It's almost as if sometimes they want to pose for you. And you know how many times this has happened to you? You've been in a forest area somewhere, and you're photographing the tree or something that's... Then when you go home and with digital cameras, you put this all on your computer and enlarge it up and you say, oh my gosh, look at that face there looking at me. Come on, look at this. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Or others say, nah, it's just a shadow. But sometimes we can capture something on digital film. So I always say to folk that when you go <clears throat> into a new area like this for the first time, take tons of photographs. Because I mean, by the time you sit there looking, trying to see a little figure, you know, you just might miss them. So take tons of photographs, go home and have fun. Also, another little tip. Walking into forest areas or an area for a first time, could be a river, could be a beach, could be a beautiful verdant paddock. Take the time to announce yourself. Introduce yourself to the unseen world. Say who you are. You could do this out loud. If you're with uh, a company of disbelievers, just do it internally. But, and so you can give a reason why you've come here. You can give thanks to the nature spirits and to everything that's there. But the big secret is, now you've done this with your eyes closed. You've done this, open your eyes, and then you wait for the response. You just don't walk off then or get the camera out. You wait, and it could be quite a few minutes because sometimes the responses take a little while. And they'll come in any number of forms because the fact that you have focused on what you're doing, everything else in the other world out there, you've left back in the car in the car park, so you're in this new environment. You open your eyes, you're seeing things with more clarity, your hearing has become more finely tuned because you are listening and watching for an answer and it'll happen. And sometimes it may be just as uh, simple as a leaf 
falling off a tree and suddenly, oh my gosh, look at that, and slowly goes down to the ground. Or you may suddenly hear the trickle of water and you had stopped in a place where there was a mossy bank and there was water just dripping down into a small pool. And you hadn't quite heard it before, but there it is. Oh, wow. And then you may become aware of a bird, which was, was there the whole time, not necessarily singing, but just sitting on a branch, watching you, waiting for you to acknowledge the bird. And then, of course, depending where you are, you may hear the distant sound of children laughing. And you know there's no school children in the area. And what is it? Is this the Patapai Rehi? Because they are renowned for having lots of fun and laughing and playing. And then, I guess the um, one which a lot of us have experienced and can happen any time, I spoke earlier on about the Wairua, the spirit wind. And you can be standing there in a little forest clearing, no breeze around you, and suddenly you hear, it'll even fluff your hair up and you'll just feel it and that's an answer. So answers can be very, very subtle and from these realms that I'm talking about, these realms which are right ad adjacent to the realm that we live in, they will often communicate by using other means, using nature, using the trees, using the water, using the bird or the insect or something like that. So look upon this as an acknowledgement and if you do, this then allows you to um, uh, approach the natural landscape in a, uh, in a different way. Because every thought that we have, every action that we take, there is a reaction somewhere on the planet. And I like this little piece here. And as we walk through the landscape, our shadow passes over the grass on the lawn, or the shrubs, or the flowers in the garden. And our shadow passes and touches that momentarily. Then we move on. But in that moment, we pass over the lives of so many little things that see us briefly and then almost forget. Yet, we leave them not quite the same. There is an indelible print fixed in their sometimes uncomprehending minds. So, and when I say uncomprehending minds, uh, as I'll talk to you on Tuesday, I'm talking about the grass on the lawn, which we stand on and we mow, but it's not unconscious at all. You know, with five, thank you. Is that five to the finish or five before we have questions? Thank you. We, we do sign language here. <laughs> now, I just want to talk quickly about elves. And this is where Descriptions of the, the Patipai Arehi seem to be of elven-like creatures, which are so tall, uh, fair or red hair, green or blue eyes, fair complexion, slim of build. So in ancient literature and of course in modern research, people are now saying the elves are real. And simply put, the elves have always been creatures of the forest. In ancient times, they were creatures of magic. They possessed the ability to blend in quite naturally with their surroundings, much as if they were a bush or a plant, that you might pass by a thousand times and never notice them. And this was the thing, we, in this day and age, move so quickly uh, in our daily lives, travelling from A to B in a, a motor vehicle or a hitchhiking on a helicopter. You're, um, <clears throat> you move around very, very quickly. And this is why it is so wonderful to be able to take the time to walk for a while in a landscape. And particularly if you can do it in bare feet, that enhances your connection with Papa Tuanuku. You're looking in anticipation. You want me to say something else? All right. So, as we say, elves are there. Um, if we took the time and we were genuine, I think, some of us could make connections, if this is what we desire. Okay. It's, um, I read somewhere recently, someone is researching into the dream state, and they say, when we dream, it's like we are showing a film of our dreams on the ceiling, and within that film, the fairies are. And you'd think about 
the wild dreams that we have, and sometimes if we can remember anything of them, where they take us, and the people that come, or the beings that come into our dreams, where do they come from? People say from the subconscious, perhaps. I was wanting to know with the, the, the fairies. Um, so, on some aspects, we hear that there are people with second sight, seeing a, a realm beyond, like fairies in the, in the etheric. And what you mentioned today was um, people uh, viewing them physically, like walking across the road. So yeah. Are they like interdimensional? They can operate in both dimensions, or are they one or the other? I don't like your views. It's, it would seem that the term interdimensional would probably give an answer to that. And they live in a dimension which is right alongside of us. Quantum physicists are now saying there are so many other realms of existence in the biosphere of the planet that we are not aware of, which is intriguing. So they are. I mean, stories like that, um, which, which are just amazing. Uh, I'll add another little one here, and this occurred uh, a while ago. Uh, the Tangawaihini Valley up north, south of Waipua Forest. Father and son, after milking on a summer's evening, thought they'd go rabbit shooting up the back of the farm. Walked for ages up the back, right onto the bush line. And um, Dad thought, well, we'll sit down, I'll have a cigarette here. He rolls a cigarette, and they're sitting back right by their boundary fence, looking down over the farm. And suddenly, the fence wires start to creak as if someone's climbing through the fence. And so Dad sort of looks along the fence up there. There we have the inevitable little people or children climbing over his fence, and there were five of them. And so he was looking like this, and he nudged his son, and the son came forward a bit. And these little figures were obviously taking a shortcut from the, that bit of forest down a little valley over the ground to another clump of forest. It was like a, a, a gully. And so then the father thought, well, what on earth are these children doing in the back of our farm coming out of the forest this late at night on a summer's evening? So he stood up to have a better look, and so did the sun came round. Now, the five little people had not observed the father and son there at that time. But what they noticed, and this is quite astounding, there was a little figure running around the feet of the larger figures. And then suddenly the, the father realised that these weren't children and that was <clears throat> much more than a little baby. It was like a four-year-old child, but this big, running around the feet of his parents. And then the child saw them and started running towards them like this. Then suddenly the others, who were the adults and probably the parents, saw what was happening and quickly swooped the little one up, looked at the humans, down the hill, through the fence up the other side, leaving father and son, not knowing what on earth they'd seen. And one more little story I'll fit in here, which tells you what happens or how it can happen, particularly in nature. Um, when we were filming the last few days of the documentary, we were taken by a hunter up the end of the Tangawahini Valley again, and to show us in daylight a place where he parks his car when he goes hunting. And inevitably, when he's out there before the sun comes up, he said, oh, I always see these little people walking down that track out in the forest across the road and across the creek. So nothing to see in the daylight, but he showed us where it was. Good. One of our vehicles got stuck in the mud. No tow rope for some obscure reason. Back down the road I shot to the nearest farm. Drive up the driveway to the farm. The farmer's just coming out to get in his ute. And uh, Yeah, g'day, g'day, mate. Um, what can I do for you? Oh, I said, um, we've got our vehicle stuck up the end of the road. Uh, he said, oh yeah, then he folds his arms, well, what are you doing up there? <laughs> the farmers want to know and the strangers in their, in their vicinity. And I said, oh, I love doing this. I said, oh, listen, we're just finishing uh, filming a documentary on the little fairy folk of the forest. And, uh, <laughs> and he looks at me and his arms fold even tighter. <laughs> no, you're going to love this. You haven't heard the punchline yet. And he says, oh yeah, he said, Though, you mean those little beings I see when I'm hunting? He said, I'll be walking down the track there and um, suddenly a little figure will pop out from behind the bush, look at me and run off in the opposite direction. How about that? <laughs> Unsolicited. <laughs> so, they're there. can be that close. Very on behalf of all of us. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you.